I've spent hours and hours crunching the data and building the formulas. And now I'm ready to give you my top 12 basketball card investments for this season. My name is Jeff Wilson. By day, I invest in tech companies. And at night, I invest in sports cards. Join me on my journey to profit from the hobby we all love. card investors and welcome to another episode. I am excited about this one today because guys, I have been putting in the work, building these crazy spreadsheets of data and analytics to break down everything that might happen this year in the sport of basketball and correlate it to card values and population counts and what cards I think are most investment worthy. And we are about to go through that list here in just a second. And I've got a couple of really important tools for you to get you ready for this NBA season and basketball card investing. The first is the Sports Card Investor app. You've heard me talk about it the last few shows. It is now free and available to you in the App Store on your phone. And it is a great way to track what basketball cards are trending as we get into this season and also find great deals on them. So go right now and search Sports Card Investor in the App Store if you have not downloaded this free app yet. Second of all, you guys know about Market Movers. Market Movers and now Market Movers Lite, available for only $24.99 per month. If you want the most in-depth understanding of how basketball card prices are trending, what basketball cards are getting hot, and where investment opportunities lie, you want Market Movers. This is the perfect time to get it because card prices are going to be going crazy as the NBA season tips off. For more information on Market Movers, go to sportscardinvestor.com and click Market Movers in the main menu bar. Here's the third thing, guys. All of the picks I'm about to go through, all 12 picks, I have just posted to the Sports Card Investor website as the main featured article. So you can follow along with this episode by going to sportscardinvestor.com, clicking on the main featured article, and it's gonna list all of the picks I go through as well as links to all of the key cards for each player on eBay. So you can instantly go check eBay pricing. I even included in the article what the most recent sales price of each of those cards was. So it's really easy for you to follow along. And if you want to invest in one of these players, it's a great free resource for you. Also, by buying any of these cards through any of the links in the article, we make a little bit of a commission, which helps support this show. So we certainly appreciate you doing that. Go to sportscardinvestor.com and the featured article on the homepage is about to go through all these picks. Okay, we're gonna get started with the picks. And in order to help me debate these picks and 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 pick my picks apart. I am going to bring in a friend of the show, Hollywood Ari. Ari was on the show for the NBA preview episode before the bubble started and gave some really great insights, a lot of predictions that came true. So I'm bringing Ari back because this guy knows a ton about the NBA and he's going to add some great commentary to my picks today. So without further ado, let's get started with the top 12 picks. Hollywood Ari, welcome back to Sports Card Investor. Good good to be here. It's um, in beautiful Los Angeles where no one is allowed to go outside, but uh you know, looking out my window, it, it looks nice out, but we're all not allowed to go anywhere. Well, at least it's you good to be here. At least we have the opportunity to do this, and you're going to have the opportunity to watch a lot of NBA because the season starts in just a few days, which means it's an exciting time for people buying and selling basketball cards, which obviously is what we're about to dive into here. That sounds fantastic. I'm ready. So I want to give the audience a, a disclaimer right before we get started here. I'm about to go through a list of basketball cards that I recommend buying this year. I've actually got a a few different lists to go through. I've got these players grouped into different categories. But the disclaimer that I'm going to give is you're not going to hear the really big names veteran players. You're not going to hear me say LeBron. You're not going to hear me say Steph Curry. 
uh, those types of players. And of course, also naturally, you're not going to hear me talk about retired players, Hall of Famers, you know, that type of thing, right? And the reason why is because I compile this list based upon whose card prices I think can move the most over the course of this season, right? For long-term investing, if you're putting money into players and, and just going to park it in a, in a player for 10 years, I think LeBron's a great investment. I think Steph Curry is a great investment, but they're not on this list because I don't think LeBron or Steph Curry are going to see their cards go up as much over the course of this season as some of the other guys I'm going to talk about today. So this list leans towards the younger players, leans towards people who are perhaps a little bit more speculative, but the people who, if they have good years, could have a really big pop. So that's the first thing I'm going to say. The second thing I'm going to say is the list I'm about to go through is all based on a data calculation that I did. It's all based on data. It's not based on my own conjecture, right? So what I did is I took several different data points and combined them all together. I looked at 538. I love their data. Uh, they're owned by ESPN. It's Nate Silver's uh, data analytics company. I They just came out with their 2020-2021 player projections. I took their offensive plus minus projections as well as their wins over replacement projections, combine those together. Uh, I also took each player's age, factoring in obviously younger players. I weighted more heavily in this formula because they have more upside potential in the years ahead. I also took into uh, account the team that they played for, players whose teams are favorites to make deep runs into the playoffs. According to Vegas odds, I weighted them more heavily. I also looked at the card value of every player as well as the rarity of, of every card. So what I'm looking for here is value play. So I'm looking, I'm, the card value, I'm looking for card values that are a little lower combined with players that have really good projected offensive stat potential this upcoming year uh, as well as they're young in their career and they're on a good team. If those factors all come into, come into play together, they're going to get a really high score in my rankings and you're going to hear them on one of my lists. So that's how I came up with this. How are you, are you with me, Ari? Were you able to follow this so far? I, I, I think I'm with you. I think I made it through the entire maze. I would just like to give the caveat to anyone uh, watching or listening that my opinions are a thousand percent based on nothing but conjecture. Uh, I didn't do any of that particular research, but I watch a lot of basketball I work in television, so I, I don't have any sports professional acumen, uh, but my only other time on this podcast, I said that Dame Willard and the Blazers were going to run through the bubble and make it into the playoffs and not your precious Zion and the Pelicans or John Morant. And uh, I also put out that Fred Van Vliet would be one of the biggest free agents this offseason and that the Knicks would make a strong run for him. They did, he stayed in Toronto. Uh, his loss, but I feel like, you know, my conjecture has held up a little bit. So we'll see how this goes. All right. So here we go. So, so I'm going to give you my data driven picks and then Ari is going to give you the conjecture to tell you if I'm on point or if I'm out of my mind nuts and the data is completely wrong. So let's, let's get going here. So first of all, let's first, this first group of player, these are going to be the top four big name stars from the last few years that I think are still investment worthy heading into this season. So these are guys who either have recently signed max deals or they will soon to sign max deals. They're kind of your top, you know, top cream of the crop from the last four or five seasons. So here we go. And keep in mind, I'm also looking at value as well when I'm coming up with these rankings. So number four, Jason Tatum. What I like about Jason Tatum, he's got a pretty high offensive plus minus at 3.6 projected for this next season. Obviously, he gets a boost being on the Celtics and they're going to be a contender in the East. And of note with Jason Tatum, he's only 22 years old. He's actually the youngest player of all of the top players from that 2017 draft class. He's younger than his counterparts in that draft class. So he's got a little more basketball ahead of him and a little bit more growing to do than other guys like, for example, Donovan Mitchell, who's actually a few years older. So uh, for, those, for those reasons, I like Jason Tatum a lot. He's in my number four spot. What do you think, Ari? Uh, I love it. And also for further context, uh, Obi Toppin, who I really like, you know, Nick's draft pick, uh, he's coming into the league this year at age 22. And when you think about all that Jason Tatum has done, this is without question now his team 
Uh, you know, Gordon Hayward injured off and on, but now not even a distraction. He's out of the picture and Tatum is the face of the Celtics. Uh, I love it. I think that they are going to be contenders in the East. And I'll talk about this more a little bit later because I, you know, I have some things I want to discuss, but Tatum is famously a Drew Hanlon guy, one of the best uh, NBA trainers. And if you just listen to anything or read anything about Jason Tatum, his work ethic, how he came up in St. Louis, you can just project every single offseason, even in a truncated offseason like we just had coming out of the bubble. He's going to put new moves out there. He's going to put in the work. And so he's a a guy like a Kobe Bryant who every year is going to make some sort of leap, even when he's at the upper echelon, he's going to add something to his game. So I love Jason Tatum. There you go. All right. Excellent. We'll see if you love my next one. Number three of the big name players to invest in this year. I've got De'Aaron Fox and I put De'Aaron Fox in the big name category. He did just sign a Max Steele um, and his cards have been escalating in value. Now his statistically... When you look at his projections this season, not as good as Tatum's, for example. However, his cards are about a third of the price of Jason Tatum. And so why Fox rose in the rankings was really from more of a value perspective that you can get in on his cards a little bit less. And this guy still has a great uh, potential ahead of him. What do you think about De'Aaron Fox? So I love him as a player. And uh, if there's a value proposition in terms of what his card is worth uh, as compared to what it might be worth, there's, you know, maybe some sort of value in that. But in terms of someone who makes a leap, uh, I can't see it. Uh, the Kings are perpetually a mess, and even more so now. Uh, I don't like losing Bogdanovich. Uh, Buddy healed. They shopped him. They couldn't make a trade. He's kind of uh, a little bit, you know, discontented there. You have a weird roster. Bagley can't stay healthy. You add Hassan Whiteside to the mix. Uh, never known as like a very strong, you know, uh, locker room guy. And the West is loaded and the Kings are going to be bad. And then they just drafted another point guard in Halliburton. So, I, you know, if I'm going to put my money somewhere, I'm not betting on De'Aaron Fox making any sort of noise this year because even if he plays lights out, that team around him is poorly constructed and is not going to go anywhere. Well, there we go. Our first disagreement, and that's okay. My number two guy of the big names is one I don't think we'll disagree because it's the most obvious big name out there right now of the players from the last few years. And that, of course, is Luca. Uh, Luca, a lot of people think this guy's going to be an MVP candidate this year. Uh, his wins over replacement, projected wins over replacement for the next five years is the best of any player to enter the league over the last 10 seasons, according to 538's projections. So, I mean, we're talking about someone who is already, uh, you know, looking like he's going to be an all-time great. A 6.9 plus minus, that is incredible. That is almost double Jason Tatum and Darren Fox's plus minus uh, projected for this season. Uh, and obviously, he's on an up-and-coming team with the Mavericks as well, and only 21 years old. So there's a lot, despite the fact that Luka's card prices are already up in the stratosphere, I still, even at the current prices, I still think there's good value in buying Luka cards right now. Uh, I got to completely agree on this one. You know, we're not really doing like, the, I, got, I don't have any hot takes here. I can't, you know, zig where you're going to zag uh, because... You know, Luca. there's a lot of NBA experts who are predicting that he could win the MVP this year. Uh, so even if Giannis has another huge season, no one's giving him three MVPs in a row. And there's a lot of preseason hype that Luca could be the MVP. Porzingis is injured. Uh, he's notoriously fragile. He's supposed to come back in January, but they're going to be very uh, delicate with him. So Luca's usage rate is just going to be off the charts. And something I also like, kind of a little bit of a hidden factor, the trade of Seth Curry for Josh Richardson. Josh Richardson coming in, he can play the two, obviously, but I think what's most important is you got a lot of strong point guards in the West. Luke is not known to be a very good defender, and obviously he's got to expel a ton of energy on offense. Now you can rotate Josh over. He can guard you know, the Devin Bookers, the Dame Lillards, and Luca maybe is going to be able to take a little more rest on defense. I like that trade for them as a team. And then conceptually, I like it to make sure that Luca is fresh for offense where the money gets made in terms of card prices. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And so there's a lot to like about Luca, but surprisingly, he was not number one. The data did not come up with him number one in my analysis. It actually came up with his big time counterpart from the 2018 draft class. Now I know everybody is going to think I'm biased when I tell you that my number one guy is Trey Young because everybody watching knows that I am a big Trey Young supporter and I own a big Trey Young collection. All of these things are true, but this is entirely from the data. And ESPN's 538 projections for next season actually have Trey Young projected at a higher plus minus offensively than Luka. Trey Young is at a 7.2 projected plus minus, the only player in the league with a higher projected offensive plus minus rating next year, according to 538's data, is James Harden. They got Trey right behind James Harden in the second spot in the league. Trey Young is only 21 years old, and he rose in these rankings above Luka because his card prices, while they've gone up a lot this offseason, they're still significantly lower than Luka's card prices. So Trey Young, my number one investment pick out of the big name guys heading into this next season. So again, I got to completely agree. Uh, Trey Young mm-hmm. primed for a massive season for a variety of reasons. One, uh, the Clint Capella trade, he came over, you know, towards the end of last season. They didn't get a lot of time to play together, but I think it's a huge improvement for their team, and it also opens up a lot of aspects for Trey Young's game. So you have Capella, you got Gallinari, then you got Bogdanovich. Um, the important part of all of those, I think, is you've got three big bodies who now can run the pick and roll with Trey, and you've got someone in Capella who's going to make the rim run and roll to the rim, right? So if the defenders all come to Trey, he's dumping it off. He's getting the assist for an easy bucket. With Gallo and Bogdanovich, you've got two big guys who they're going to pick and then pop. So, again, what I think I really see happening is that you're not going to see teams being able to trap Trey Young to double him and get the ball out of his hands because you've got competent scorers all over and big guys that can set a pick and then make the defense pay if they stay with Trey Young. On top of those things, two big additions in the offseason. Uh, one, Rajon Rondo, great locker room guy, uh, beloved by young teammates around the league as someone who's a really good mentor. And then also Chris Dunn. So these guys are not going to take any sort of minutes from Trey Young, but what they both have in common is that they're lockdown defenders who don't really do anything on offense. So you've got Trey, who's going to candle the ball most of the time. But let's say you're down a little bit and you're coming up against a strong point guard. They're playing the Nets. you got to have someone guard Kyrie. Trey is definitely not a good defender. Okay, well, now you can bring in Chris Dunn to play the point and has a confident handle. And on defense, he locks down Kyrie or tries to. And Trey can play off ball at the two. And now all he's doing is hunting for three-point shots, running around picks, and not expending a lot of energy to bring the ball up the court. So on top of all those things, the Hawks' ownership has gone all in, and they've kind of a little bit short-circuited their trajectory in saying, we're spending the money, we want to make the playoffs now. And so that's just only going to raise the profile of the team, raise the profile of Trey Young, and if they're making the playoffs, I think – it's because Trey Young's had a massive season. And I like all the moves they made in terms of making him the focal point and further expanding the value that you know he has as a player. It's going to be an exciting year, especially being here in Atlanta to see what the Hawks can do this season. But I'm, I'm certainly optimistic. All right, let's switch to a few players who are a little more under the radar. We just talked about some big, obvious names there. Now let's go a little bit under the radar. I'm going to give my best three value picks. And for value picks, I'm looking for players from the last few years whose prism base rookie cards in raw can be found right now for $50 or less, under $50. So that's what I'm looking for right now. Uh, Number three on this list, I'm going to go with Keldon Johnson, the up-and-coming player uh, for the uh, San Antonio Spurs out of Kansas. Uh, averaged 9.1 points per game last season in his rookie year. This He's going into his second year right now. I think overall he's a good value. He's got upside. Uh, he's only 21 years old. I, I like the trajectory that Keldon Johnson can go on. If you want to take a little bit of a chance on one of last year's rookies who's a little more under the radar, I think he's your guy. What do you think? I think it's 
completely rolling the dice. I think uh, I think last season he played a total of 17 games. He seemed to really uh, pop in the bubble, uh, you know, for lack of a better word. Uh, but going into this year, he's dealing with a foot injury. He might not be there for the start of the season. And then if you look at the Spurs depth chart, uh, you got a lot of like kind of young pieces that they've invested in ahead of him. You know, could this be the year that Lonnie Walker like breaks out? They just drafted Devin Vassell, who's been getting good run in the preseason because he's known as a defender. And that's kind of that Spurs ethos. So, you know, sure, it's uh, anything could happen, but I, I can't see like a clear path uh, to him having some sort of huge upside. And the Spurs are known to take their time developing players. And if you're talking about someone who's coming into the year already banged up, uh, they usually are going to wait until someone's 100% healthy. So he's not going to hit the ground running. And there's a lot of guys ahead of him. And I don't know that I can really see it. I also don't know that I see the Spurs really competing uh, this season. They're kind of stuck between, you know, the old guard. You've got, um, you know, LaMarcus Aldridge and DeRozan. You know, where are they going with their careers? And then you've got other guys who are on a totally different timeline in terms of how old they are. So it's a team kind of going in opposite directions. All right. It's going to be interesting to watch for sure. My number two guy People out there are going to laugh because people have been watching this show for a long time know that I have long, long ago began believing in Lonzo Ball and have believed in Lonzo Ball throughout. And people are sick of hearing me talk about Lonzo Ball. It's become a little bit of a running joke with the audience. Uh, But I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, guys, this is, again, 100% based on statistics. And according to 538's projections, Lonzo Ball has a better wins over replacement projection if you map his career out for the next five years than Donovan Mitchell, than Bam Adebayo, or than De'Aaron Fox. Lonzo Ball has got a better war than those three guys. He's got a he's got a decent offensive plus minus. And of course, he's on an ascending team with some other star power on that team and a team that looks perhaps ready to make a jump heading into this year. So I've got Lonzo Ball as my second best value pick because his cards are affordable compared to a lot of the other guys we've talked about in this show. Thoughts on Lonzo? So you should go in long on Lonzo. Very high upside. Uh, I, I have to agree. You know, my thinking on this is, if not now, when? And if not now, maybe never. Because you look at their, you look at their roster, Drew Holiday is out, Bledsoe comes in, but they have never, they haven't invested a lot in Bledsoe, and I think he'll probably be coming and eventually playing with the second unit. And I love Lonzo's game. And then on top of that, hopefully you're getting a full season with him and Zion together. That's going to open things up, and that's also going to provide a lot of highlight plays. But I think the big thing is, if they're competing, they're going to, he's going to get the spotlight. And I like the addition of Steven Adams. They had a notoriously bad defense last year. And a lot of that, you know, Zion, really um, a liability on the defensive side of the floor. But you get a seasoned veteran, a strong center to man the rim and guard the paint. I think that the Pelicans um, are going to have a good year. I think Brandon Ingram is going to have a great year. And so I think, you know, a rising tide lifts all ships. I think Lonzo, uh, I agree. I think Lonzo has a lot of upside and a lot of value. And now let's see if you agree with my number one value pick for the 2020-21 NBA season. A guy who made a tremendous leap from his rookie season to his second year last year, Devontae Graham. Devontae Graham uh, had less than five points a game his rookie year in 2018-2019 last season averaged close to 19 points per game, an absolutely massive leap. Um, His plus minus projected for the 2021 season from 538 is 2.7 on the offensive side, which out of all of the players from the last two draft classes, not including the brand new rookies this year, but from the 18 and 19 draft classes, he's only behind Luca and Trey. He's got the third best projected plus minus out of all the players from the last two draft classes. I think I think Devontae Graham is an exciting player. He's going to continue to put up more and more points. His team is obviously not the best, but I think his statistics are going to take another leap this year. I'm looking for a big season from Devontae Graham. What do you think? I, I think Nate Silver, I hope he's better with his basketball statistics than his political ones because I, I just don't see it here. Uh, you know, I love Devontae Graham as a player. 
I think you can look at last year, though, as a lot of good stats, bad team. But beyond that, uh, he's just not the focal point of what the Charlotte Hornets are doing. Obviously, they drafted LaMelo, which, you know, we'll wait for you to get on the LaMelo train after, you know, Lonzo. So a couple of years from now, it's all going to be LaMelo for you. But they invested a huge pick on LaMelo. He's a face of a franchise guy. Then they went out. They spent a ton of money on Gordon Hayward, way overpaid. So they got to justify making that deal. So he's going to be showcased. And then on top of that, they spent a ton of money for Terry Rozier last year. And then Devontae Graham pretty much supplanted him. But they'd love, they'd love to trade uh, Terry Rozier somewhere. But that contract is pretty much untradeable. So will they, will they feature him? Will they try and get him more minutes? I just think that Devontae Graham is not going to have the opportunity to put up the stats he did last year. It's just not – the organization didn't invest in him. They didn't see what he did and then try and maximize his future potential. They went the opposite direction. So, you know, certainly I'm sure there's value there. I just don't see – I see too many obstacles for him to even replicate – what he did last year, let alone go above and beyond it. We'll see. I mean, you're, you're right that they certainly add a LaMelo ball and will that be a hindrance to him? Possibly so, but we'll see. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe they can get something going together. These are all, these last three players were all players whose cards are still relatively cheap to get into. Again, less than 50 bucks for a Prism Raw card. So they are more of a roll of the dice for sure, but they're three guys who I think are ro- worth rolling the dice on. Now let's switch gears real quick, and I want to talk about a rookie from from the 2019-20 draft class. That obviously was a great draft class, and you got a lot of big names like Zion and Ja headlining that class. But when I broke down all of the players from the 2019-20 draft class, if I could choose only one to invest in based upon the value of their cards compared to what their career looks like this season and in the next few seasons... One player jumped off the paper compared to everybody else when I ran them through the statistical formula, and that was Tyler Hero. Tyler Hero ranked way above Zion, way above Ja, uh, and and above everybody else in that draft class. When I looked at all of the all of these factors together, your thoughts on Tyler Hero? I, I have to agree. I love Tyler Hero. I think you're going to see this year Dragic is going to see even more minutes. At the point, you know, part of the reason that they kind of got derailed uh, in the finals is that Dragic is getting up there in age. He's been nicked up. I think they're going to kind of be playing more for the playoff run. I think he's probably going to rest a lot. So you're going to see Hero uh, sometimes bringing the ball up. He obviously can play off ball, even if Dragic isn't on the court. Jimmy Butler can handle the rock. So I like Tyler Hero a lot. Um, But I feel like he's somebody that, investors got a huge uh, view of during the playoff bubble. And I would presume that's caused his card prices to kind of rise and rise because that was very visible what he was doing in the playoffs. And and they did certainly. Yeah. For me. And obviously I'm a long suffering Knicks fan. And this is as I previewed all conjecture, Mm -hmm. but I would say as objectively as I can be that it's a great time to buy RJ Barrett cards. Um, so he, you know, had an up and down rookie season, but now things have really aligned for a real breakout in year two as kind of like a post hype candidate. And there are certain things I lied. I did a little bit of stats research. Um, one of the, one of the things that really held back RJ Barrett last year, the, his strength of his game right now is kind of bully ball, take it to the rim, back down, you know, shorter opposing guards and forwards. And the problem was he was a very bad foul shooter last year. He averaged just around 61%, which is terrible, even if you were playing center. That's like Shaquille O'Neal level foul shooting percentages. So those are just free points that he's just giving away. And it's something that a lot of stuff in the press that he worked on in the offseason, in the preseason right now, and I've watched all his games, he is shooting 87% from the line. His stroke looks good. And beyond that, uh, a couple things. One, he's known to be a gym rat. He works out with Drew Hanlon. Uh, if any viewers, I don't want to give press to another podcast or on your podcast, but great interview that Ryan Rossillo did with Drew Hanlon over the summer. 
talking about how he got his start training Bradley Beal, talks about Jason Tatum, and talks about R.J. Barrett, but just what this guy requires of the people he works with. And so I feel very bullish that R.J. Barrett is going to have a big season. And then you look at what happened with the Knicks in the offseason. Finally have a real coach in Tom Thibodeau. Uh, Beyond that, they didn't get Fred Van Vliet. They didn't get Gordon Hayward. So they didn't spend wildly for other free agents. They didn't try and trade for Russell Westbrook. Going into the season, they're not going to be a good team. But the whole team is focused around, let's get R.J. Barrett the ball. He's going to have a huge usage rate. He can bring the ball up. They've added some shooting. Uh, Emmanuel quickly has had two really nice preseason games in a row. So they don't, they can't spread the floor enough, but it's going to be better than last year. And I really foresee a big season for RJ Barrett. The Knicks won't be good, but the New York media spotlight is massive. And if he's putting up numbers, even on a bad team, that, that media attention will filter out nationally. Like it always does. I mean, New York has more sports pages than, you know, many, uh, like maybe the whole country combined. There's like seven different beat writers who are going to be writing about R.J. Barrett every single day if he's putting up, you know, 25 points, 10 rebounds, six assists. He could be getting to those numbers this year, especially with his foul shooting improving. So I like R.J. There you go. We got a bonus pick from Ari. All right, we will be R.J. Va- RJ fans this season. Let's see what he and Tyler Hero can both do. All right, Ari, we're going to end on this. We're going to go rapid fire four players who are a little more veteran in their careers, who I feel are just absolutely undervalued. When I look at the price of their cards versus the statistics that they've put up in recent years, plus what is expected out of them over the next few seasons, their card prices are so low. And especially when you combine in the rarity of their cards compared to a lot of the current day players from the last few years, These guys jump off the page of just being really undervalued in the hobby right now. Potentially safe places to put some dollars if you want to go for some more of the veteran, you know, type players. The first, the the number four guy on this list, Ari, James Harden. He's got the best wins over replacement projection, the best offensive plus minus projection, and his rookie cards in, in really high grades are super rare. There were just not that many cards produced or graded from his rookie season. Obviously, he's got the possibility of getting traded to a contender, forcing a trade to a contender. I I think James Harden represents a really good value. So the entire system in Houston was built around him and to get him stats. So if he's getting traded, he's not going to put up the same numbers necessarily. However, his cards have always been undervalued, even when he was putting on those huge stats for Houston. So I think I kind of agree. No matter where he goes, it, pre- it presents something different and a change and an opportunity then to compete. There's no telling where he might get traded to or whether that team will find a way to win a championship. But in my opinion, any change here is probably good. So in terms of card prices and to kind of you know give a little bit more juice to people interested in collecting his things. So I would have to agree. Number three, I've got Carl Anthony Towns. I mean, he's been hidden up there in Minnesota. People kind of forget about this guy, but man, if you look at his statistics, they are really strong and they're going to continue to be strong for the next few seasons. Incredible war, uh, really good plus minus. Uh, By the way, his cards, and this is where, this is really why he jumps off the charts to me. Carl Anthony Towns rookie cards are less than Jalen Brown's rookie cards. And like, I get that, you know, Jalen Brown's on the Celtics and Jalen Brown has has shown some numbers and some potential, but he is not the player Carl Anthony Towns is. Carl Anthony Towns' rookie cards are less than than uh, Shea Gilgis Alexander, less than Ja Morant. Granted, I know that those are guys with bright futures out ahead of them and they're exciting up and comers, but Carl Anthony Towns has proved it on the hardwood, yet his cards are, are so undervalued in my opinion. Your thought? My thought is I can't, I think there's no chance that Carl Anthony Towns finishes his career in Minnesota. And I think this year is not going to go well. And he's, there's already been rumblings that, you know, to try and navigate, to play with Devin Booker, to try and like, you know, move somewhere else. So if now's an opportunity to buy at a low ebb, I don't know that in the short term it's going to go up, but I think long-term he's going to move to a bigger market or a contender 
and his game is tailor made for the current NBA. And I can see his stats won't, won't decline, but the exposure that he gets and the team he plays for, I see it changing in the next one to two years. So I, I got to agree, it's a good time to buy and it's a long term investment because uh, he can really play and the modern NBA really suits what he does. So he's going to be very valuable to teams. And I think someone's going to find a way to trade for him. I think he's probably the next superstar under a deal to say, I want out. And we see it every year. People don't expect it's going to happen. People didn't expect, you know, it was going to happen with James Harden. But as we've seen, the guys want out, they get out. And that's, I think, coming for Carl Anthony Towns. And if it does, it will probably be great for his card prices, as you said. So we'll see what happens there. We'll watch that closely. Our number two guy, another guy worth watching closely this season, Joel Embiid. You know, there's a lot of drama around the 76ers. They made a lot of offseason moves. There's rumors that they might make more moves. We'll see what happens with him. But much like Carl Anthony Towns, statistically, this guy puts up incredible numbers. And he contributes both on the offensive side as well as on the defensive side. Contributes a lot to that team really good outlook for the next few seasons, yet his cards are once again inexpensive. Could this be the year that the 76ers start to fulfill their promise a little bit more and uh, he sees a boost? I think definitely. I think Doc Rivers, can he get your team over the hump to win an actual title? Maybe, maybe not. But what he does is give instant credibility and your team is going to be a perennial contender. He knows what he's doing which you couldn't say the same for Brett Brown. Then you got Daryl Morey, a great GM. And look, if you were to say a couple of years ago when Josh Richardson was on the heat that he's going to get traded for Seth Curry, you know, you'd think that was crazy. And even in a vacuum, it didn't really make sense. But it made sense for Dallas because they need Josh Richardson's defense. And it makes sense for Philly because they need the consistent shooting of Seth Curry. So Morey understands I got to surround Embiid with shooters. And I think the most logical trade destination uh, and the best deal Houston is going to get is Ben Simmons. And I think it's a deal that they probably should make. And I think it will happen. So it's a much better fit Joel Embiid with James Harden uh, than it is with Simmons. Uh, So yeah, I think it's a good time to buy Joel Embiid. I think by all accounts, Philly is going to be his team. And, they're, and if that's the case, they're building around him. And they've already added shooting, uh, which helps free up the paint for him. Uh, on the offensive end of the floor, him and Ben Simmons kind of clash uh, because Simmons can't shoot at all. And he needs those driving lanes. And that forces Embiid out. And it makes him into more of a jump shooter, which is not his best skill set, even though he's a very good jump shooter. But yeah, I th- I see things changing in Philly for the better. And I think that only goes to help uh, and being and beads long-term outlook. And my number one value guy, Ari, the Joker. Uh, look, Jokic, his numbers are amazing. He is, he is top 10 in the NBA in offensive plus minus. When we look at what he's uh, able to, you know, be projected at this next season in extremely strong wins over replacements. Uh, obviously Denver, it's a really strong team, made a lot of noise in the bubble last year, a team, you know, that really a complete team in many ways. They, they, they're really, really strong. They're going to be a force in the West for some time to come. And Jokic's rookie card is less than Zach Levine. I know people, people like Zach Levine. He can dunk. He's a little flashy, whatever. His cards are less than Zach Levine. That is such disrespect for this guy who is 10 times the player Zach Levine is statistically. Give me a break. Give me a break. The Joker, guys, there is value right now to be had with the Joker. Uh, I, I'm, sh- I'm shocked about that, Zach Levine. I mean, he's flashy. People like his dunks. But long term, the value of a card no one's making the Basketball Hall of Fame because they won the dunk contest. And Zach Levine isn't going to win anything ever on the court, I feel. And the Joker, uh, phenomenal player. And I think you also see there was rumblings that could Denver put together a package to go big name hunting? Could they put you know pieces together and try and get James Harden? Would they throw Michael Porter Jr. in there? They didn't really do any of those things. And it doesn't sound like they're going to do those things. And I think the, the feeling being 
They know that they have their nucleus. They're great at player development. They're going to draft guys in the lower end of the first round and use them to complement Jamal Murray and Djokovic and um, Michael Porter Jr. So I like I like uh, the Joker. I think that's smart. Yeah, I, I like him as well. And I, think and I, actually... I, said, I think I said Djokovic, uh, but obviously I meant Djokovic. Uh, so... I made it the whole podcast with all my conjecture and none of my, none of my research. And now I'm throwing out tennis players, but, but if your viewers, I don't know how many invest in tennis cards. I don't know if they make those, but you know, you maybe double up on your Joker portfolio. You get Joker in tennis, Joker in basketball. You can't go wrong. Don't worry, Ari. I, I make a I make a little slip up like that every few episodes and my audience kills me for it. So I'm going to expect you to be killed in the comments below. But I do like your tennis reference there because they're actually we have seen some uh, some some quite some uh, increase in Federer cards and Nadal cards here over the course of the last few months. And by the way, that is not that is true. That is the truth. Tennis cards have been hot in the hobby. They've been hot. Uh, and we were just talking about Denver. I like Michael Porter Jr. too. He was a guy who didn't make this list, but he was like honorable mention. He was just just off the list in terms of guys who uh, had a real chance to continue to go up this season. So anyway, Ari, I know you got to get out of here. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. And I think we gave the audience some great information. Everybody, thank Hollywood Ari for joining me. And thank you, sir, for your, uh, for your picks for this year. This is great. And uh, RJ Barrett. Big year. Let's go. There you go. Let's make it happen. All right, sir. Take care. Okay, you too. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. As a reminder, all of those picks are up on the sportscardinvestor.com website right now as the featured story, as well to, as well as links to all of those players' key cards uh, and the last sale price of all of those cards so you can go check to see what the market's doing. And of course, if you click any of the links, they'll take you to eBay. If you end up buying any of the cards, it supports the show. So please go check out the article on sportscardinvestor.com. Also, download the Sports Card Investor app from your app store. If you have not done so already, it's free. Search Sports Card Investor in your app store. And finally, check out Market Movers. It is the best data and analytics pro product to get you an edge on the basketball card market this season. Go to sportscardinvestor.com and click Market Movers in the main menu bar for more information. Appreciate you guys watching today. Would love to hear what you think about the picks. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And of course, if you have not subscribed, hit the little subscribe button and the little bell icon so you can be notified as we're coming out with new episodes throughout this NBA season. Thanks, everybody. See you soon with our next episode.